Well, hello, I'm Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service, and I'm happy to welcome you to another one of the Zoom presentations. Uh, today is the 22nd of April, uh, and I am very happy to be here talking about managing wildlife in the home landscape. I'm really going to be addressing this from two different directions. The first part of that is that there are some wildlife that we really enjoy seeing in our home landscape, whether those be birds or squirrels or butterflies. And I'm going to talk about how to draw those in and attract them and give them a nice place to live uh, right there in the backyard. Uh, but then I'm also going to talk about some of the animals that occasionally uh, can be a little bit of a nuisance for us, uh, whether they're damaging our gardens or damaging our plants, um, just causing any other havoc. Uh, so I'll also talk a little bit about uh, getting uh, those animals to be less of an issue, uh, encouraging them to move away from our landscapes. So as we talk about attracting desired wildlife, what we want to consider is that wildlife aren't really that different from us. And they really just need a few things to uh, give them everything they possibly want uh, to be happy and want to stick around in your landscape. Um, so wildlife basically has three basic needs. They need food. Um, so they're going to need something there that they can eat. Uh, and we're uh, certainly used to the idea of putting out bird feeders and things like that that are going to provide them with that food resource. So we've gotta have, we have to make sure they have food. And, you know, ideally, while we can provide them with these sort of artificial food sources, whether that be bird seed or hummingbird feeders, it's also a great idea to provide them with natural food sources. And I put natural in quotation marks because certainly you know, our landscapes are, uh, are a modified environment. We've introduced a lot of plants. So it may not be exactly what they would experience in the wild, uh, but they can certainly find food resources in the plants that we have there in our home landscapes. Now, the next thing we need to make sure that we have for wildlife in the, uh, in the home landscape is water. So just like this, they, they need water. Um, so of course, having bird baths and, and other structures like that or small water features, uh, even a, a section of rocks that water will accumulate on uh, for small an smaller animals like insects is a really valuable resource. Uh, it's gonna make sure that the, the wildlife are happier in your home habitat. And the last thing that we need to provide for them is shelter. They're going to need a place to feel protected. Uh, they may need a place to raise their young. And if they have that in your home landscape, they're going to be happier and want to stick around. So, so one thing that we can think about when we're talking about natural environments to draw in wildlife is if we want a diversity of wildlife, we do need a diversity of habitat. So the more different environments that we can have in our home landscape, the more wildlife we can potentially have. So you may need a, an aquatic uh, area in your landscape, a place where you're gonna have a water feature to have some animals that are gonna be found in that environment. Uh, you might want a meadow area with a lot of wildflowers and thickets, uh, and then a, a forested area of course, you know, often in our landscapes, we are managing a, a very small area. Um, so you may not have the space to incorporate all of these elements, but even at a small scale, incorporating some water, incorporating some brush and some trees and flowers is really gonna be the way that we can encourage these animals to be there in our home landscape. Now, you know, a lot of our uh, wildlife uh, in our, our landscape, what we're doing really is, is combining that artificial and natural shelter. Uh, so we have, we may have bird houses, but we also have plants in our landscape and features in our landscape that can support those animals. So providing shrubs, providing undisturbed wooded areas, 
really does provide a lot of room for that wildlife to use. And we can also select specific plant species that are going to be good resources, uh, both for food and shelter for the animals that we want to keep around. So I want to start off talking about birds. And there are an awful lot of birds that we can find here in Mississippi. Uh, just some of the birds that we see here throughout the year uh, include blue jays, uh, mockingbirds, uh, the morning doves, and robins, and bluebirds. Uh, really just a, an interesting diversity of bird species. But we also get some visitors here during the winter, during the cooler months, they migrate down. And so we may see things like goldfinches and thrushes, uh, and certainly here uh, at my property, uh, we have uh, ducks and geese that come in uh, during the winter time, and uh, some even stick around throughout the year. Uh, so when we are gardening for birds, some things we want to make sure we do is we want to provide them a diversity of habitats. We want to give them a lot of different edges uh, because they like to sit in those edges and sit in that protected space and we'll look out from those perches into open areas. And they use different plant heights uh, to, uh, to accommodate more than one species. So one type of bird might like to sit a foot off the ground, the next type of bird might like to sit four foot off the ground, and so forth and so on. So by creating that layered garden appearance, having some ground covers and then some small shrubs and then some trees, you provide a lot more habitat for those birds to occupy. And it's also important to know the diet of the birds that you're wanting to attract. Um, some are going to be seed feeders, some are going to be insect feeders. So understanding their diet is going to be valuable. Now, a lot of birds will feed on seed and on insects, and particularly when they're nesting, when they're supporting their young, um, they do hunt very actively for insects. Um, so avoiding the use of pesticides in your lawn is one way you can kind of ensure that those insects are there for the bird to go out and hunt and then return to the, uh, uh, to the young. Uh, the other side of that is that there are a lot of native plants that do a fantastic job of supporting bird species. And this is just a list of native plants here in Mississippi uh, that do a, a really good job of providing food sources. And you can see this goes all the way from large trees, like live oaks, uh, all the way down to small perennials, uh, things like bee balm and uh, echinacea or purple coneflower. Uh, I always like to include just a few pictures, um, things that can kind of show off the fact that even if you're trying to design a landscape for the purpose of attracting beneficial or at, attracting animals or attracting wildlife, uh, it doesn't need to be uh, anything less attractive than, than your ideal image of your landscape. So um, the very, uh, very attractive uh, tulip poplar uh, flowers and beautyberry, uh, crab apples and persimmons, uh, even that uh, the black gum tree there, uh, all serve as incredibly attractive ornamental plants. Uh, potentially fruit trees work very well in this situation also um, as ways to support wildlife while having a landscape and an environment that is beautiful. Also want to take a, a moment to, uh, to mention hummingbirds as a special case. Uh, of course, people get really excited every year uh, when the hummingbirds start to show up. Uh, now there are 21 species of uh, hummingbirds native to North America. Um, the vast majority of the hummingbirds that we see are one species. I'll talk about that in just a second. We do get a small number of occasional visitors of different species, um, but mostly we do have that, that one species of hummingbird that we see very frequently. Uh, it is relatively easy to attract hummingbirds with the commercially available feeders. Um, you uh, uh, fill those with a solution of sugar and water. Uh, you can see there it's just one part sugar to four parts water. Um, and while you can certainly purchase hummingbird uh, uh, 
feeder sugar uh, sugar water. It's very easy to uh, to make it at home as well. Um, while that red color isn't really necessary, so you don't have to add that red coloring. Uh, it will help to attract the birds initially. Uh, once they learn where the feeder is, they're not going to care what color it is. A uh, little special note, uh, I don't know anyone who's ever done this, but uh, there is a warning. You never want to add honey to hummingbird food because that can uh, uh, lead to the development of a fungal problem uh, that can be damaging to the birds. Now, you also want to keep in mind that hummingbirds can be territorial. So you never want to go with just one hummingbird feeder. Get several, uh, place them, distribute it around your landscape because that's going to keep them from fighting amongst themselves over the food. Uh, one thing I like to do, of course, you know, it's great to have hummingbird feeders. I think it's also great to choose plants with hummingbirds in mind as well. Uh, now, this is the hummingbird that we have uh, here in Mississippi primarily. It's the ruby-throated th ruby hummingbird. Uh, there's its scientific name if we uh, want to twist our tongues around. Um, they do tend to feed while hovering, uh, which is a, just a really fascinating thing to watch. Um, and even uh, though we think of hummingbirds as flower feeders, um, they will occasionally go after small insects. Uh, in fact, sometimes they will uh, take spiders or trap insects right out of a spider web. Um, and watching them do that is certainly incredibly entertaining. Um, so that's just the, the introduction to the, the hummingbird that we primarily see. Uh, I know we're seeing them already this year, and it's always fun to watch them flying around. Uh, in terms of flowers that attract hummingbirds, um, you, you, you know, looking for species with red or orange coloration, uh, species of flowers with long tubular shaped flowers, and a lot of nectar is uh, really are really going to be the flowers that do a great job of supporting hummingbirds. So uh, plants like trumpet honey, trumpet honeysuckle, uh, the bee balms, whether that's scarlet bee balm or lemon bee balm, uh, cardinal flower is a, a wonderful example. Uh, red buckeye makes a wonderful shrub uh, for that purpose, purpose uh, as well as columbine, and then salvia is a uh, and of course, there's a, a great diversity of salvia out there uh, as options for plants to support hummingbirds in your own landscape. All right, changing tack a little bit, we're going to talk about bats. Um, and often when I encounter people asking me about bats, um, they are more concerned about keeping bats out of their attic than they are drawing them into their landscape. But I think it is a wonderful animal to have around. And they're, they're interesting to watch, um, and they do play an important role in uh, dropping populations of night-flying insects. Uh, a single little brown bat uh, can eat uh, 600 mosquitoes an hour. Um, so, uh, you know, while it's probably not going to drop the uh, populations of mosquitoes down below a nuisance level, uh, I'll take every little bit that I can get. Uh, bats do prefer to roost in warm and dark protected places during the day. Um, they do actually nest upside down, just like we see in pictures. Uh, and when they go into flight, what they'll actually do is just drop and then kind of use that to pick up speed as they're starting to fly. Um, they do frequently huddle together uh, to conserve heat. So you can see in that top picture how they're all very closely huddled together. Um, and you may see uh, natural bat roosts in places like caves and rocks or in tree crevices uh, or in trees. So uh, this is, you know, one of the things that I always want to mention whenever we start talking about wildlife, um, and I'm sure I'll say this several times throughout the course of this presentation, you should never handle wildlife. Uh, in no point should you ever uh, touch any, any wild animal. Uh, we want to keep you safe and we want to keep the animal safe. Uh, and so I really encourage people, uh, under no circumstances is it a good idea to pick up an animal uh, or to, uh, uh, if it's in a trap, you certainly don't want to uh, uh, handle it while it might be agitated. So bats do occasionally get into homes. Um, they don't bore holes. So 
They'll really only enter in through holes that are already present, uh, but they can enter in through a relatively small hole, you know, half an inch wide is not a big hole at all. Um, so excluding bats really comes down to closing up any of these potential um, areas where they can enter in. Um, and uh, we also, you know, we want to make sure that we're excluding them in the fall and the winter um, because this is after their breeding season. We don't want young bats to be trapped in the uh, – uh, in the attic, and not only are we doing harm to the bats, but it's not going to do any good for our attic while they're in there. Uh, there are some one-way devices that we can install at entry points that are going to allow the bats to leave but prevent them from coming back, and we need to leave that on there for long enough to ensure that all of the bats have left before we actually seal that area. Uh, one thing that I recommend is that uh, is putting up bat, ha bat houses because that's going to give the bats an area to roost other than your house. Um, so you're going to get the benefit of the bats being there uh, without them, you know, without the potential nuisance of them getting into your home. Um, do see a question there. If, if you have bats that have decided to set up shop um, in a birdhouse, it's perfectly okay to, uh, to leave them there. I certainly wouldn't want to try to disturb them. Um, they may be nesting, you may have young bats in there, and, uh, and moving them would be harmful. Um, so I would not, not recommend uh, moving them at all. I think it's the best thing to do is just to leave them right where they are. Um, constructing bat houses is relatively easy to do. Um, we've done several workshops here in South Mississippi uh, where we actually just uh, really quickly construct some, um, and uh, and that's a lot of fun. Um, the uh, bat houses uh, can be will it actually attract them into the landscape, um, and they uh, should be. You want to locate them up above ground, about 15 feet. Uh, make sure it's an area where they have kind of a clear spot underneath. Uh, that's going again as they uh, fly, they tend to drop down. Um, and uh, uh, as they move into flight. So they really like that raised up kind of clear area underneath. Uh, you don't want to attach them directly to your house. Again, you don't want the bats kind of uh, spending all their time around the house and trying to find ways in. Um, and again, you know, eliminate any openings or eaves or vents that you may have because uh, that's going to keep you from having any problems. I just included a couple of pictures here. Um, ranging from a really large bat house over there in the top right. Um, those are some really big bat houses. Uh, underneath that, a really simple one that's just a single entry area. Um, and then you can see, even in one of these simple bat houses, uh, that really can support a large number of bats. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, just having one or two of these around your landscape really can add a lot of bats into your landscape, and, and certainly uh, they're interesting to watch and do a lot of good for people. All right, uh, going on, um, not alphabetically, except just, uh, just in this case, uh, butterflies. Uh, a lot of people really enjoy watching butterflies, um, you know, throughout the year. Uh, we have some really striking, attractive butterflies here in Mississippi. Um, the spicefish swallowtails and tiger swallowtails, uh, all of the different skippers, and uh, of course the uh, monarch butterflies that we see uh, flying um, at different times of the year. And we just want to keep in mind, you know, the best way to bring butterflies into our landscape is to provide them those same resources. We want to make sure that we incorporate habitat for caterpillars and adult butterflies. Um, you know, keep in mind that butterflies are cold-blooded. They, they need the sunlight in order to warm up at the start of the day. Uh, so give them a nice sunny area. Uh, they also like to hide under shrubs at night. So surrounding that with shrubs uh, gives them a nice place where they can shelter. Uh, and if you can, 
a small wood pile or three to five foot uh, provides a really nice shelter area for them. Uh, it can really just be a, a big pile of sticks. Um, and it's important that, again, you know, uh, occasionally you'll be walking down a path, um, you know, particularly through the woods and in an open area where there's a puddle, you'll see a lot of um, butterflies all gathered around that, just right in that moist, uh, moist dirt. Uh, just drinking water there. And that's how those butterflies get water. So providing them with mu a mud puddle or providing them with an area where you might have some stones that water will sit on top of uh, really provides them a, food, a water source that they're going to need. They also pick up minerals that way. Uh, and so uh, that's a, a really good resource for them. And now, uh, you know, when we talk about butterfly gardens, we want to make sure um, that we include, again, all of the plants the, uh, the caterpillars are going to need. Uh, one thing I try to encourage people to do if they're interested in bringing butterflies into their landscape, of course, you want to, you know, want to grab, some, get some milkweed growing, uh, ideally one of our native milkweeds, um, because it's really going to support the growth of monarch butterflies. Uh, but also look at, you know, the plants that would normally go into an herb garden, things like basil and parsley, cilantro, uh, dill, and fennel. All of those plants are fantastic for all of the caterpillars that are trying to grow. And then we want some plants that are really going to support butterflies. Uh, things like liatris and joe pieweed, uh, asters and zinnias uh, do a fantastic job of adding a lot of color uh, into the home landscape. Uh, as well as providing nectar resources for butterflies. And of course, you know, things like lantana are, are perfectly fine as well. Uh, it's a really easy plant to grow um, and uh, adds a lot of color and it can be a large plant. Uh, one thing you do want to keep in mind is, is butterflies really are attracted to swaths of color. So grouping those colors together uh, is going to make it a little bit more attractive to butterflies than if they're all scattered around. Of course, uh, you know, a lot of us are, are getting more and more interested in bees. Uh, of course, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Uh, and there are a lot of different bee species here in Mississippi. Uh, you can see there's about 400 in uh, the United States, and that's all of our native bee species. So um, in addition to the European honeybee, uh, which I think gets a lot of attention, uh, we also have bumblebees and carpenter bees, mason bees, digger bees, sweat bees, and, and many, many, many more. And bees pollinate about 75% of all of the fruits and nuts and vegetables that we grow here in North America. Uh, and those native bees are really important for pollination. They're actually more important than the honeybee, uh, despite all of the honeybee hives that we have. Uh, now, Native bees have a variety of different nesting habits. Uh, you have some that nest in the ground, some that unfortunately bore holes into wood, um, and some bees uh, make use of just the, the existing holes that are there. Uh, so certainly one way that we can support bees in our home landscape is to have flowers that are going to be favored by them. Uh, and I'll go back to uh, your herb garden, so basil and rosemary are wonderful for that. Uh, wild bergamot, uh, one of my favorite trees to have in the landscape for bees are hollies. They flower particularly early in the year, which really gives the bees a resource right at the end of the winter. Uh, of course, all of the asters uh, have uh, beautiful flowers. Uh, guara is another wonderful plant to, uh, to draw in bees. Um, so when you think about flowers, you know, most double blossoms offer less pollen, so single flowers tend to be best. Um, you know, they like blue and purple and yellow. Uh, plants like daisies and Queen Anne's lace <coughs> uh, really attract a large variety of bees. And then you have some other bees that are going to like plants that are in the mint family, like, well, mint and lavender. Uh, and you do get others that will go for larkspur, colomine, even snapdragons will be very attractive for bees. So you can see having that diversity of flowers is really going to attract a diversity of bees. And a lot of these are going to be really good pollinators as well. 
Um, so they're going to do good things for your garden in return. Um, so, you know, make sure you have that variety in there. Uh, use some wildflowers, native species. Um, though you don't have to feel bad about using plants that are not native species. Uh, a lot of species that we have, a lot of plants that we have introduced uh, or used very commonly in our landscapes are very good for, uh, for insects like bees. So um, the, uh, the crepe myrtle, uh, which is certainly not a, a native plant, um, is very commonly used as a resource and is a wonderful plant to, uh, to use for bees. Uh, now we mentioned we also want to provide shelter for bees. Uh, so we do want to make sure that we're giving them a, a bee house or a place where they can nest, uh, you know, preserve a small brush pile, uh, use areas with dry reeds or dead wood, or even just a little muddy area uh, works really well for uh, mason and digger bees. Uh, of course, you can also construct bee houses. Uh, bee houses are relatively, you know, really easy to build. Uh, you can just make a, a wooden box, essentially, uh, or a wooden square, uh, fill that with pieces of hollow cane, uh, and put that up on a board, and that is essentially a, a great place for uh, particular mason bees to go in there uh, and, um, and set up their nests. Uh, so that is uh, just a very simple way to do it. You can also take a heavy block and just drill holes of different sizes into it and, and attach it to a um, uh, vertical surface, uh, and, uh, and that will work very easily as a bee house. So something you can do very quickly. Uh, I've seen incredibly elaborate ones um, that have all sorts of bees in them, uh, and I have seen extraordinarily simple bee houses um, that also have all sorts of bees in them. So um, be as simple with it or as decorative and complicated as you would like to be. Uh, now, I, um, squirrels are another animal occasionally that uh, I have people ask me, how can I bring these into my home landscape? And then I also have some people asking me, how do I get rid of them from my home landscape? Um, and one thing that I really encourage people not to do is to put out squirrel feeders. So uh, where you have squirrel feeders, you wind up with an awful lot of squirrels and they wind up being supported above the level of the population. So more squirrels than that area can really support. Uh, and that winds up with them fighting and if the food source goes away, um, they can cause some serious property damage, they can damage trees, um, chew up all the vegetation, uh, they'll even get so hungry they start stripping the bark off of trees. So I encourage people to avoid the use of feeders as ways to bring in squirrels. Um, try to protect your bird feeders from them as best you possibly can. Uh, squirrels are quite cunning. Uh, but, you know, add some trees into your landscape that are attractive to squirrels for the purpose of habitat. So things like red maple, hickory trees, and fringe trees, uh, Chickasaw plum are all really attractive plants that are attractive to squirrels and will bring them into your landscape without supporting the population higher than it should be. And so you don't wind up with a problem, but you still wind up with squirrels that you can enjoy watching out your back window. All right, so with that said, I am going to, to move into talking about some of the animals that we may wind up with uh, in our home landscape um, that can cause us a little bit of trouble. And so uh, what I want to think about first, you know, of course, we, we think about, uh, you know, wanting to provide what, you know, what we want when we want to attract wildlife, we want to provide them food, water, and shelter. So. Um, you know, some, some aspect of trying to get rid of these nuisance animals is going to be removing particularly the food and shelter that they might want. Uh, so we can use the removal of food resources. Uh, we can use physical barriers. That would be exclusion where we put up fences and things like that. We can remove potential sites for them to shelter. Uh, we can use repellents uh, to the extent that we can, uh, we can find ones that work. 
And, you know, we also can actually directly remove the animal, and that, that would be through either trapping or through by, by shooting them. Uh, and I always want to include a, a note here at the end. You know, I mentioned this earlier, and I, I did say I was going to mention again. Um, there is really never a good time to handle a wild animal. Um, I love my pets uh, just as much as I'm sure you do. Uh, but uh, wild animals, uh, you know, they can be dangerous. They can potentially carry disease. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that everybody is safe. And we also don't want to hurt the animal. Um, so... Uh, I do, again, want to make a comment, just please, under, under no circumstances, really is it a good idea to handle a wild animal. It can be dangerous for you and dangerous for them. Um, so one of the animals that I, I commonly get questions about is the uh, mole. And a mole is a small animal that digs around underneath the ground, uh, likes to feed on insects primarily, uh, they really enjoy moist, sort of sandy loam soils. They're really good for them to dig through. Um, they don't like to dig through heavy or dry clay soils. Um, and they can be pretty voracious feeders on insects. So they'll eat up to 70 or 80% of their weight on a daily basis, eating bugs and snail larvae and spiders, even earthworms. Uh, their favorite food are earthworms and white grubs. And uh, white grubs make up a big part of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, mole activity in lawns usually appears. We're going to see those ridges or uh, upheaved soil caused by them running around and foraging. And we tend to see that more in warm, wet months than we do during the cold part of the year. You know, as we try to control moles, um, you know, I, I've, I've tried to work with repellents to see if I, that will work to get them to, uh, to go away. I haven't had a lot of good experiences, uh, though there are several repellents out there. You can see a, a picture of one of those there. Um, and I also have not had a good experience with, uh, with traps. Uh, you either have a situation when you know, you're trying to put that trap down in the ground, um, uh, the mole, uh, like a lot of small animals, is, is what we call neophobic. You know, it doesn't like to see new things. So it's going to be kind of, you know, scared away by the presence of this trap. You might get the occasional mole, but I, I just don't think they're very effective. Uh, you may have a, a dead mole in the trap that you have to dispose of, which can be really unpleasant. Uh, or in the case of a humane mole trap, so you've captured the mole, what do you do with it now? Um, and that can be a, you know, as much of a struggle as dealing with them in their lawn. Uh, I think the best thing we can do to control moles is try to remove their food sources. So application of lawn insecticides uh, that are going to knock down populations of white grubs and other soil-dwelling insects. Uh, is going to remove that food source away from moles. Uh, and once you take away their food, that's going to encourage them to go elsewhere. I do want to include just a quick note here. Um, there is another animal called a vole, uh, V-O-L-E. Um, those are a, a, a plant feeding uh, animal that looks very similar to a mole. It's about the same size. Uh, also digs around the uh, ground. Um, occasionally they come up to the surface a little bit more, um, so they are a little bit easier to trap. Uh, you really can't uh, get rid of them just by removing their food source because they're eating the, the plants that we enjoy having there in our landscape. Uh, so we've already been asked about armadillos today. Uh, armadillo is a kind of an interesting animal. Uh, it's the only animal you're going to see that has that really hard, uh, kind of shell-like uh, uh, structure. Uh, mainly see these at night, uh, and they root around in the ground searching for bugs and grubs, uh, other invertebrates like earthworms. Again, they're just looking for dinner. Uh, one thing that will happen and uh, can be quite spooky for, for us is if you manage to sneak up on an armadillo, um, they will jump pretty much straight up in the air with all their arm, with all their legs out, 
um, which I know as a defense mechanism worked to uh, get me to back off from the armadillo um, as a defense mechanism. In some other instances, it may not be as effective. Um, you know, often, you know, they're, they're not really sneaky animals. They, they make a lot of noise as they're trundling around. Uh, and they do t dig up your yards. Uh, another warning, uh, you know, certainly don't want to handle armadillos. There are several diseases that they have been known to carry. Um, uh, you know, don't encourage people to kill animals unnecessarily. Um, so, you know, don't by any stretch of the imagination think, you know, armadillos are going to make you sick, so you should do something about them. <clears throat> but again, it's just a, another good example of, you know, not wanting to handle wild animals for a variety of different reasons. <clears throat> As with moles, removing the food source for armadillos is really the best way to get rid of them. Uh, so they're feeding on grubs and other insects that are in the ground. And if you can remove those insects by the, the spreading of a, a granular insecticide over your lawn, um, you're going to have an armadillo that's going to decide to go looking elsewhere to food. Uh, for food, um, there really aren't any toxicants or repellents that work well for them. Uh, they don't seem to mind any of them. Uh, you can trap armadillos if you choose to. Um, you can use a, a standard kind of, of live trap. Uh, it does work better if you put those wings, you can see in the picture there, how some boards have been used to kind of expand that uh, area, expand that entrance. And essentially, as the, the armadillo comes along, it's going to hit that wing, and just you, it's going to be guided down into that trap. Uh, there really aren't any baits or anything that can be effective for trapping armadillos, uh, so it's not really necessary to put a bait in there. Uh, as they're exploring, and they tend to you know, hang, you know, try to hang around edges of places, um, they'll just kind of wander in and can be trapped there. Um, that does lead us to an important question, however. Once you have trapped the armadillo or any other animal that you might have trapped, well, where, what do we do with it now? <laughs> and uh, it's important if you are going to trap an animal of any sort, uh, you need to contact uh, your local animal control uh, authority, uh, you can contact your sheriff's animal control officer or contact the uh, Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and Parks um, because there are regulations about trapping animals and certainly the regulations about transporting and releasing animals. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're not transporting something that you shouldn't be uh, to some, somewhere that you shouldn't be. So I encourage you to do that. And there's just too many differences in different communities for um, uh, for what you can and can't do for that to be to described as part of this presentation. Um, now, if you have a small area that you're trying to protect from armadillos, um, you can use this, an electric fence, a single strand that's about three to four inches up from the ground is generally going to be enough to keep them out. Uh, now, you know, I, I enjoy watching raccoons on video. Um, they're uh, really fun to watch, and they have all sorts of interesting behavior. Um, they, they look incredibly cute. Um, uh, raccoons tend to prefer wooded areas near water. Um, they'll den up in hollow trees or ground burrows, crevices in rocks. Uh, but unfortunately, occasionally, they'll also decide to set up uh, beneath decks or in outbuildings that they've managed to sneak into. Uh, and raccoons will really eat just about anything. They'll eat plants and they'll eat animals. Uh, so very opportunistic. Uh, and one of their favorite food sources is pet food that we have left outside overnight. Uh, so that's certainly one thing we want to pay attention if we're developing a raccoon problem. Um, and raccoons are just an animal that has done fantastically well as humans have spread, they, they, urban and suburban environment popula you know, uh, urban environments are great for raccoons, uh, so their population can, uh, can get very large. Um, and while they are cute, again, we do want to make sure we, we do pay attention to the fact that they can be dangerous. Um, and some things we can do to control them, make sure that any food that's left outside, so a garbage can has a really secure lid, 
uh, isn't in a situation where it can be overturned. Um, if we're leaving food outside for pets, ideally uh, take that in before nightfall. Uh, and one thing that I do occasionally see people doing, and I really want to discourage you from doing, is please do not feed raccoons. Uh, while it, you know certainly they're enjoying the food, and I know it's a lot of fun, uh, doing that really just makes them, first of all, it makes it, them dependent upon you, uh, and it sort of trains them that they can come close to humans, uh, but we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that they're domesticated. Uh, so you know, where we are interacting closely with animals like that, where there is the potential for harm, both the animal and us. Um, again, where we have a, a small area we want to protect, you know, electric fence is another option. We want to make sure that we're closing off accesses to chimneys or any other enclosed areas. Um, and if you're going to trap raccoons, hire a professional to do that. Um, they're going to have a, the, uh, the means to do that safely. Uh, and uh, they... Uh, also are, are going to be able to do that with the safety in mind for the animal and, and have something they can do with the animal uh, once it has been trapped. All right, I know there are a lot of people who are really uncomfortable with snakes. Um, so a little bit about what I'm going to say here is just an advertisement for all the good that snakes do. Um, snakes don't cause any property damage. Uh, and they really do help us out by removing rodent populations or removing potential other pests. You know, this time of year and in the fall, we tend to see them a lot more. They're out there looking for food. They're looking for an area to hibernate in the fall. Um, and again, it's a situation where, you know, you know, people get bitten by snakes very often when they try to handle snakes. Um, so, you know, certainly an animal you want to leave alone. Um, there are a, a lot of guides out there for identifying this snake or that snake. And, you know, you look at the eyes of this snake to determine whether or not it's poisonous or look at the shape of its head. Um, I encourage people to treat all animals that they encounter um, as if they are, you know, potentially dangerous. Treat them with respect. Um, you don't want to you, you don't want to react in fear, and you don't want to do any try to do any damage to the snake. Uh, but you do want to respect it uh, and make sure that you don't get hurt. Uh, some things that we can do to try to control snakes around our own landscapes. First of all, just mowing closely around homes and outbuildings <coughs> is going to re remove habitat for them. Uh, store any firewood or lumber away from the house. Uh, a little bit of a distance just because we don't want the snakes living right up next to us. Um, keep those mulch layers down. Uh, that's more to prevent rat populations or mass mouse populations. So keep those mulch layers down. We're not inclu in, including a, <coughs> excuse me, a rodent population. Uh, so we, we wind up with less snakes. Uh, make sure we're closing up any cracks or crevices. Uh, to prevent them from having an area uh, that they can come in, make sure all of our doors and windows have tight-fitting screens. Uh, of course, one of the other things that we can do to help control snake populations is to ensure that we're controlling the population, mice, rats. Um, so uh, the, the standard black uh, poison trap that you would uh, have in your home landscape to include those pop to, to reduce mouse populations, or rat populations, are also going to be really effective for getting rid of snakes, simply because you don't have that rodent population around. All right, uh, just really quickly, uh, I have a control for birds in the garden. Uh, birds can be a nuisance in our vegetable gardens. Uh, because they uh, uh, they want to feed on the fruit, um, it can be very difficult to manage them. You can use netting as one way to uh, try to uh, back them off uh, and keep them from having direct access to the plants. Uh, there are a number of other things that can be tried. Uh, 
the uh, the important thing here is whatever method that we use to try to keep garden bir birds away from our gardens. You know, they, people have suggested you know reflective materials like pie plates and things like that. Um, the um, <clears throat> uh, and that reflection will occasionally you know cause the you know get the bats to uh, to go away or the birds go away. Um, sorry, I'm I'm looking at two different things and uh, I'm trying to get my words crossed there, uh, but. We want to change up the things that we're using to try to keep birds away. Birds get used to things, so even things like where we have a sound uh, that may uh, drive the birds away, we want to change that up and change uh, how they're experiencing it so that they're not getting used to that phenomenon and it'll continue to work. All right, uh, we, oh goodness. Uh, <laughs> That was fascinating. Um, so deer are another animal that we commonly encounter in the home landscape. Um, the, um, uh, they do like areas that contain a mixture of fields and woods. And a lot of times we have a big population of deer coming into urban environments because the population uh, in, our, uh, in our surrounding area, in the forests around where we're living, uh, have gotten large and they're basically being pushed out into urban and suburban environments uh, to find food. So uh, we usually wind up with females giving birth to, twin, to twins and mating does usually occur in the fall. Um, so the challenge in dealing with deer uh, is really that they, they do eat quite a lot. Uh, they'll eat about seven pounds of food per day. Uh, they will feed on a wide range of different plants, and they love the new growth and really succulent, fresh growth on plants. Um, and feeding on that plant, can, feeding particularly on that young plant tissue, can completely destroy our plants. Uh, as far as trying to deal with deer, uh, fencing really is the most effective means to do that. Really difficult to do around our entire landscape, but it is something that we can do around the garden. Um, and you can see, if you look at the image of that fence, um, it's actually two layers of fencing. Um, so as the deer try to navigate through that fencing, uh, they, they encounter that second line. Uh, and that will really help in deterring them. They, they don't see well in three dimensions. Um, so they have difficulty trying to get through that, that fence. You do have to make sure that you are keeping that fence on and active with no breaks. Uh, test that voltage regularly. Uh, and generally speaking, they're going to try to go un under or through a, front, a fence rather than jump over it. Now you can just have traditional fencing. You can make that look really nice, uh, really attractive. Uh, and that may have some effect in, a, in uh, deterring deer. Uh, just keep in mind, and this is my favorite picture, um, that uh, even with tall fence, uh, deer may attempt to go over it. Uh, this one got caught, uh, but uh, they, you know, they can get, uh, can get really interested in what's on the other side of a fence and really want to go over it. Uh, they'll certainly give it a try. Uh, there are some deer repellents out there. Uh, they usually work by having kind of an offensive taste or offensive odor. Um, and, you know, it, it's important that we try to, um, you know, try several different repellents because what works in one place may not work in another. Uh, and factors that are going to contribute to that may have maybe the feeding habits of the deer, uh, different environmental conditions. Uh, and, and, you know, continually applying a repellent uh, can wind up being pretty costly and pretty labor intensive. Uh, so, you know, where you have a low number of deer, you have light damage from deer, and you're, you have a relatively small area, uh, these repellents can be effective. Uh, in other situations, it, it can be difficult to apply them in a way that's going to work. Uh, now, there are some plants, and I often get asked, you know, what plants should I include here uh, that are going to be plants that the deer won't eat? 
And, and so far as I've been able to tell, we can have deer resistant plants, but we can't really have deer proof plants. So, you know, when they're when it's the right time, if the if the deer are stressed, uh, they're going to try to eat anything they can. Uh, they are always going to prefer that spring growth, that new growth. Um, they prefer that hot, that that uh, really nice vegetation with high water content. Um, and they will be more attracted if you've got plants that are over fertilized or over watered. Uh, they're going to be more appealing to deer. Now there are some characteristics of plants that uh, the deer do not prefer to eat. Uh, and those are going to be things with thorny or prickly leaves, uh, plants with a really strong scent, um, and then also plants that are poisonous or produce a really latexy sap. Um, also, you know, plants that have really hairy leaves. So some good examples of plants that deer tend to avoid. Um, cypresses and crepe myrtles are not popular with deer. Uh, angel's trumpet, which is uh, which is highly toxic. Uh, holly, and, which you know, of course, has all those um, you know thorny bits on it, and sweet olive. And for bedding plants, things like begonias and African daisies and calla lilies uh, are all fairly effective for being deer resistant, uh, though again, not deer proof.